Welcome to the Resilient Retail Game Plan, a podcast for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable creative product business with me, Catherine Erdley. The Resilient Retail Game Plan is a podcast dedicated to one thing, breaking down the concepts and tools that I've gathered from 20 years in the retail industry and showing you how you can use them in your business. This is the real nuts and bolts of running a successful product business, broken down in an easy, accessible way. This is not a podcast about learning how to make your business look good. It's the tools and techniques that will make you and your business feel good, confidently plan, launch and manage your products, and feel in control of your sales numbers and cash flow to help you build a resilient retail business. In the future, are we going to be buying from people or from brands? That's one of the questions that we delved into in today's episode. Hi, I'm Catherine Erdley. I'm your host, as well as the founder of the Resilient Retail Club. The Resilient Retail Club is my membership group for product businesses. You can find out more at resilientretailclub.com. I'm joined today on the podcast by Chris Lamontagne, who is the CEO of Spring. And Spring is a global creator platform. What does that even mean? Well, it's all about how the lines between commerce and content are blurring and how the people that we follow and interact with and consume their content are having an impact on what we buy. I really enjoyed today's conversation. I hope you do too. Chris has such an interesting perspective on how the way that we buy is shifting and we cover all kinds of things from how the platform works to the fact that aren't we all creators as well as lots of thoughts about how the industry is going to be shifting going forward. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Um, no, thank you for having me. It's uh, I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation. Oh, me too. So just before we get started, I wanted to tell you a story because I thought this was quite funny. I was in my office. I work from home. So I was literally in my office working away. My daughter bursts in, who's 11, and she's very excited she says to me, Mariah Elizabeth has just <laughs> pre-released this book. And I know you know who Mariah Elizabeth is, but if anyone's listening, then she's a YouTuber. Well, I think of her as a YouTuber. You'd say she was yeah. a U- yeah. predominantly YouTuber. Creator, yeah. yeah. Creator, yeah. yeah. She's very into her arts and crafts. Uh, she paints squishies. So, you know, when people talk about their niches, like she's got a niche of painting squishies. My 11-year-old, massive fan. So, uh, and she was really super excited about this pre-order and she'd been saving up her pocket money specifically because she knew it was coming. And so, you know, she said, can we please, can we, can we order it? So I went ahead, ordered it. And as we're checking out, I realized that it sold through spring. So yeah. <laughs> that was an interesting, I thought, oh, perfect timing. And it's a great segue into maybe if you could explain a little bit more about how the spring platform works. What a perfect introduction, in fact, in terms of uh, <laughs> such an ideal layup. But yeah, so I, I'll kind of, uh, I'll give you a, a, a quick flavour into, into the Spring platform. Um, but the business has actually been around, uh, coming on 10 years now, so it's definitely been around and through different iterations as a platform. But today, we kind of uh, describe ourselves as, as the leading creator commerce platform. And what we mean by that is we work with creators. So it could be Mariah Elizabeth, YouTubers, Instagrammers, bloggers, artists who want to build their own commerce businesses. And we provide them the tools to do so. And specifically, those tools are the ability to create a product, the ability to then sell that product and not just sell it through a store, but also sell it through YouTube or through Instagram or through TikTok or through any of the social integrations. And then we also handle the fulfillment of that product as well. So the actual shipping and order processing and payments and returns and all of that complicated stuff that typically creators don't like to to get bogged down by. So we kind of see ourselves as like a subset of social commerce, of this kind of movement of content and commerce kind of coming together and particularly driven by the creator economy. That's where we kind of uniquely try to position ourselves as as the leading platform. To put a number to that, we actually have just under 9 million creators on, on the platform. Oh, wow. So it gives you an idea of the breadth and scale. So Mariah Elizabeth is, is one of the nine, but is almost like a 
most perfect example of, of <laughs> how to, like a how to, you know, she releases content and products at the same time and they intermingle so well. So yeah, couldn't have been a better case study to start <laughs> with. <laughs> and I thought what was interesting about going back to Mariah Elizabeth, because I, I was looking at your Instagram account, for example, and Effectively, what we're talking about is an advance almost on the whole print on demand model, mm. if, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it, where you could create content and then print it on demand. But it seemed to go a bit beyond that. So Mariah Elizabeth, again, going back to that, mm. she had some plushies, some stuffed versions of the <laughs> Gosh, it sounds ridiculous. Honestly, it's just because I live with an 11 year old girl. So I'm fully versed in all of this. Yeah. So she has these plushies of her squishies that she paints, which are obviously not just printed on demand. They're actually yeah. fully created products. So you don't just, for example, have t shirts that people can print on. You go beyond that and they can actually create fully designed products, if you like. That's exactly it. Yeah. But, but, but the business was very much rooted in print on demand, mm-hmm. arguably. You know, in our in the first uh, incarnation as Teespring, that's kind of where where the business started. Yeah, you know that print on demand T-shirts, logos on T-shirts was very much where the business started. But I think when I looked at the when I originally originally was introduced to the company, I, I became CEO about five, four and a half to five years ago. Now, I think I looked at the platform and recognized that the commerce architecture of what we built didn't necessarily need to just apply to print on demand and specifically we were seeing creators like mariah and adam savage who runs tested we've got individual content creators who were creating this really interesting content and thinking beyond the product range that we had so we kind of re-architected our platform to kind of be able to respond to those ideas so whether it's a, a plushie or whether it's a makeup palette or whether it's a fitness brand or even digital files which is one of the really fast growing parts of our business really kind of re-architect and arguably the print on the mountain business was maybe the hardest part to do in the very beginning and now right. actually what we're laying on is a lot of the supply chain architecture to allow creators to really be able to come up and create anything so let's say that somebody can create a product like like the plushies let's just yeah. go with this example so how do you manage the international logistics? Because Mariah Elizabeth's an American creator. Yeah. I'm still slightly scarred from the time that my daughter persuaded me to order Norris Nuts merchandise and I didn't realise it was coming all the way from Australia with all of the you know, accompanying uh, costs associated with that. <laughs> so is that is that a challenge that you have to overcome, sort of the, the logistics of a global, of, is it a true global audience? It is, it is truly global. And I think one of the fascinating things about creators is they're almost borderless. You know, they can be US based, but have an audience in Mexico or have an audience in India. And so I think, yeah, it has been a challenge for us. I think what really helps is is the scale component of our business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and specifically, you know, we're not just designing for a handful of creators, we're really designing for the masses. And again, building out a supply chain that worked with print on demand globally first, we were then able to kind of build on top of that and build 3PL partner centers globally. So that's really the secret sauce is, is the scale side of we're not just you know handling one creator's products. That's when it becomes super expensive to your example. Instead, yeah. we're shipping, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of product on a daily basis. Wow. So it's a question of multiple production sites presumably across the globe as well yeah we have a network a spring network so it's basically that's where all of our different fulfillment partners are and what's amazing about creators is we're able to kind of understand purchasing patterns and behavioral patterns of how products are going to trend so there's obviously a huge data component to the business that really allows us to kind of understand how to how to build a respond like a responsive supply chain yeah, no, I can see that. I mean, I can only imagine the complexity. And I think it's really fascinating going back to what you're saying, because I was when I was thinking, when I was preparing for this interview, I was thinking about the fact that I work a lot with product businesses. So people who have decided to start a product business, they want to sell products. And then quite often, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to convince them <laughs> of the importance of showing up online or helping people overcome because there's a lot of, especially if you're not digitally native, it isn't something you've always done. Then 
for a lot of people, the thought of showing up on camera and talking to the camera and talking about your products is, is really difficult. But of course, for a creator, as you say, you know, my daughter was able to give me chapter and verse as to what was in this <laughs> Mariah Elizabeth book because she'd done a whole video all about it, talking about it and how she picked the the characters and the, you know, what how she decided what content went into it. So I can totally see how it's a real natural fit for these people who live and breathe on camera to then be talking about their products as you said and and then all of the the data and the viewer numbers I mean they're just staggering especially on YouTube that just the number of followers these people have is just absolutely mind-boggling well it's like I think that if you zoom out into kind of the macro in my mind creators represent the new brand they Mm -hmm. kind of represent the digitally native, they were born online as creators and therefore they understand online better than anyone. And I think that's a, like that's really kind of the, the bet that we made was we understood that the, the, this group of people who understand the internet probably better than, than anyone else. So yes, yeah, so there is a real kind of, there's a real attraction, but, but if you kind of go even further, you can see that there's this movement happening of content and commerce converging into like one swirly kind of can't quite define it you know we all signed up to instagram to look at other people's photos and all of a sudden i've spent you know all this money buying things that i didn't even know i needed and we're seeing that not just in instagram but you see it on youtube you see it on tiktok you see it on pinterest now twitter shops commerce is becoming part of our social lives so yes, the creators is the kind of conduit to make that happen makes uh, makes a ton of sense. And I think as it pertains to kind of traditional or people who would maybe describe themselves as not creators, mm-hmm. I think what's super interesting is the platforms in which that are alive today allow you to amplify what it is you're creating in terms of a brand and, and in terms of a product. So Instagram is a free to use product. Spring is a free to use product. Arguably, there's a there's an infrastructure to be able to tap into almost on day one to be yeah. able to try your ideas in, you know, some of the horror stories we heard with creators ordering, you know, warehouses full of stuff and then trying to sell it, you know, yeah. I'm sure will relate to maybe some of the listeners of like being yeah. labeled with way labeled with stock. I feel like there's just a new way to, to partake in business in that way, which I think is super interesting. I mean, I think you made some really fascinating points there. And it reminds me that around Christmas time, I work on a trends report, well, sort of an extended article for Forbes about the trends in retail coming up in mm-hmm. in the following year. And I uh, was having a conversation with Shopify and Demir Kavara, who's their head of product there, was talking about how this 2022 is going to be the year that it's really about that almost like entertainment and shopping. They're mm. just blurring, right? Like exactly as you said, the, the commerce and content, it's really intertwined. So with the younger generation saving up their pocket money to buy something from a YouTuber, but also as you say, for all of us to be shopping on Instagram, on TikTok, and just the way that it's like anybody who creates content almost now has the ability to to monetize it totally and like and it, if you kind of like understand what underpins that content in commerce it's really a sense of community mm. of like of being part of a community and, I, and i'll give you a great anecdote of a creator that we've got on our platform called matthew mega who just before christmas decided he wanted to launch a product he's really big on instagram he's in kind of like a sports pundit type niche yeah. goes live in kind of like sports commentary young guy and he came up with a hoodie which was like kind of like an inside joke to his community like it was a red hoodie that said dialed in on the hoodie and right. You know, I'm sure he won't mind me saying it as like either me or you, Catherine, could have designed this hoodie. It wasn't <laughs> like a special, a special hoodie. It wasn't. There's was nothing special about it. But you know, he really captured his community with this particular hoodie. It was a, like an in joke. Yeah. Started wearing the hoodie within his his social profiles, going live wearing it, and he made six hundred thousand dollars in sixty days by selling <laughs> wow. a by selling a red hoodie. Yeah, and I think what it speaks to is it wasn't people weren't just buying the red hoodie; they were buying the the person behind it and that sense of community that comes with that. In the same way as you know, I'm sure your daughter would buy other books, but the fact that it's the Mariah and Elizabeth book, yeah, there's a meaning. There's a difference in meaning to it. 
Yeah, no, for sure. That's such a great way of putting it. And, you know, that kind of was one of the questions I had is that, is this a new brand loyalty? Is it about then you think about the personalities or as you said, is it about the community? Because imagine how it feels if you, if you love this, if you follow this guy and, and you get one of his red hoodies, the feeling that people get if they see somebody else wearing it and they're just like, oh yeah, you know, there's somebody else who gets the in joke. I think it's beyond brand loyalty, though. I yeah. think it's it's so much stronger. I think there's such a big differentiator between brand and customer than there is to creator and fan. And if you really understand fandom, like truest fandom of like why you're interested, and at Spring we spend a lot of time like almost deconstructing the, the role of fans and like understanding that, you know, there's some, there's some creators who have like total super fans, right? Every single product that they launch, this person needs to buy one. There's some creators who have more passive fans who are like really interested in a particular design. And, and we spend a lot of time analyzing that as, as a business, but I think it's beyond brand loyalty because, and you know, I think this is where social media plays a huge, huge role I'm not sure you follow a brand on social media because you want to hear what the brand has got to say. Mm. Whereas you follow a creator because you either are pulled towards that person's content or who they are or what they represent. And I think that slight nuance in definition really speaks to just the differentiation between what was defined as brand loyalty through like almost super fandom, I think is the way we would kind of think about it. I always love it when I get people on the podcast who agree with me because one of, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I often say to people in my membership and things like that is that imagine we, we get so hung up on this idea of needing to have a huge audience. And of course, you know, having a big audience really helps, but it's the, it's like you say, it's those super fans. Cause if almost every small business, if they had a thousand super fans who would buy anything that they put out, mm. that's enough to make most businesses almost even move from the small to the medium category. You know, it's like, so where we think about, oh, I need more followers, I need more this and need more that. And then sometimes it's about, well, is that what you need or do you actually mm. need, like you say, the, the super fandom? So, so OK, so I'm going to have to ask you, like you said, you've deconstructed this. Is there, I mean, I know that there's no such things like a formula for a super fandoms, but are there certain traits that you see in the creators that do get these super fans? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, you know, the reference to a thousand true fans, right? There's an amazing article if anyone's not read a thousand true fans. It was a a very, very famous uh, internet article about 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh It was Kenny Lawton. I can't remember the guy's name who wrote it, but really good piece if if you want to read about that. And it's this concept, right? A thousand true fans who believe in what you do. Now, there was an updated article written uh, maybe a year and a half ago called A Hundred True Fans, which is definitely worth checking out. That's an A16Z who's one of our investors. And it's this kind of like the web three concept to just like a hundred people who care about what you do and yeah. definitely worth che- I'd, I'd recommend checking it out to, to the formula something we see is followers is is it can be a red herring the number of followers and you know i think we've kind of lived through you know click farms and audience growing and all of that stuff we've lived through all that world already you know what you really need to look at is comments and engagement yeah that is where you know, living in the comments as, as a creator is that's that's the secret source. And you know, don't think any creators will remind mind. Yeah, <laughs> mind me, mind me kind of sharing that is creators who are having dialogue and having information and having real meaningful dialogue with that community and those fans. That's really what we see. So that's kind of the, the secret weapon to unlock commerce is that engagement within within the comment section. Right. Okay. Yeah. So engagement. So size is not as nearly as important as whether or not you're engaging and whether what you're saying is engaging your audience yeah and i think even if you like even if you do look at from a like how platforms algorithmically serve content they serve content based on engagement right it's like hey this yeah this, there's a lot of traction it's not about follows and likes anymore it's about that there's a piece of content here that is like it's, it's sparking interest in dialogue and particularly if you're trying to talk about a product or you're trying to talk about a new release or a pre-release, you know, that's kind of uh, like the master stroke really is using the content to kind of spark that conversation. Right. Yes. 
So I, I wanted to move on and just ask you a, a quick question about live streaming, because, again, when I was looking at uh, when working on the whole, the, you know, the way that the whole industry is shifting, I was curious because you mentioned at the beginning that obviously one of the, the big pluses of the Spring platform is that you can link in. You don't just have a website. You have an ability to sell through social. Are you seeing an increasing proportion of sales coming from live streamed events, as it were? Yeah, we, we definitely do. We see kind of very spiky behavior when it comes to live streams. So it's like very short and concentrated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, we, we did some analysis around this of understanding, okay, so why live stream? Why does it work? And, you know, the, the feedback is what works with regards to live stream and, and understanding it is there's an authenticity at play. Mm. There's a kind of like I was there moment. I yeah. was there during that live stream. And like there was a product that was available that was only available ever for that live stream. Yeah. And you're seeing it right now with like digital products and NFTs particularly, I think do very well in, in live stream, but even in physical products, you know, you know, there's an interest in offline proxy. It's a bit like going to a gig and buying some merchandise at a gig, you know, yeah, there's, a kind, yeah, yeah. there's an interest, interest in like offline proxy of like flexing the fact that I was there. Yeah. So there's some interesting dynamics at play there. And we think we think of live stream as that, you know, we plug today we plug into Instagram on, on live and then we also plug into YouTube on live as well. So create we do see creators go live, but the stuff that works really well is the really authentic, you can only get it here mm. type stuff. That's what works really, really well. It's about the exclusivity then. So I thought that was really fascinating. So and that's the beauty of you know going beyond print on demand to basically create on demand that you can say, right, I'm gonna have this design, but it's only gonna be available during this time period because yeah. the products, so for all of your products, then they don't exist effectively until they're sold. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With the exception, like, let's say if it's a plushie or yeah. something that you've kind of done, but, but 95% of products here won't exist. So if you think of that, it's kind of almost a digital concept to say like, hey, this is the product. And then the minute someone buys one, they then go into production. production. So it's like a just-in-time supply chain, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I know I thought that was really interesting because it's, it's it's funny because you know I've been kind of watching more and more of these live streams just to just because it it's fascinating it's almost like this mini mini shopping channel it's like becoming full mm-hmm. circle to like everyone was running their own QVC and yeah. um, my friend Elizabeth and I were just <laughs> we, we were watching one the other day that was people selling pick and mix. And then it was just like, but they, they, they were literally going live and going, oh, I've got a, I've got a scoop here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's People um, just going bananas. <laughs> but, but it's interesting. I wonder if like if live stream, what post pandemic live stream looks like as well. If there's like that kind of, I think it makes it a great like kind of uh, <laughs> retroactive or like yeah. it's a kind of like a retro nostalgic, yeah. nostalgic thing, which you probably yeah. haven't been able to do for you know, two years. So I wonder yeah. if like that kind of is having a play there of some interesting, interesting like social dynamics that are a part of that. Yeah. But also as you say, for that feeling like you're part of something. Yeah. Yeah. So then just to wrap us up, I feel like we could talk about this all day. It's such a fascinating <laughs> subject. Thank you so much for all of your insight. It's really interesting to hear it all, but I guess I'd love to hear what do you think is the future then for, as you said, we're beginning to really see this blurring of lines, or maybe they're already blurred. Maybe it's all just one thing, content and commerce together. But where do you see it going? Yeah, I think we've got quite a, a deliberate opinion that we see creators as as the future. Because mm-hmm. content and commerce, I think it's undeniable that you can, you know, you can zoom out and see that. But we see c- content creators as, like I said, the conduit that kind of pulls all this stuff together. And specifically thinking of yourself as a creator rather than an entrepreneur or a builder or like, I think you've got to think in that kind of creative way. And then if you really unpick, you know, our definition of a creator is anyone with an idea and anyone with an audience. So, you know, it, we don't stipulate on the size or, but, but those two things, it's kind of like, a, you know, at Nike, they define athletes as if you've got a body, you're an athlete. Right. You know, so, so um, you know, we, we kind of take this very broad demographic approach to what creators are going to be. And, and we believe that supporting creators is going to really be like the commerce or retail of the future is going to be driven through creators. I do think there's an interesting question, which maybe is still unanswered, is like, 
how do brands and creators play together? Mm-hmm. You know, we've got like influencer marketing, which this is just my call is I think it's a red herring. I think creators are the new brands and therefore like actually, you know, brands have got to really think about this quite hard. And I think I've got a quite big challenge probably to kind of stay culturally relevant because I think creators are going to be the, the real powerhouse of, of commerce in the future. I mean, do you think it's generational? Do you think that it is it is very much that Gen Z is, is is embracing this more than, say, millennials, baby boomers? Or do you think that we're all going to be, do you think we'll just find more creators coming online that, that there'll be, you know, baby boomer live streamers mm-hmm. <laughs> selling? I don't I, know what. I, I think we might already be there. I think we yeah. might already be there. Fair. If you think about, I think you think if you, if you look at YouTube as as a, as probably the best example. Yeah. You know, if you think about YouTube's dem- like audience demographic, well, first of all, yeah, Gen Z, teens, like yeah, YouTube and TikTok. You know, you can yeah. definitely feel that. But even to like, you know, my brother in law is like a DIY enthusiast and watches like our fifteen minute long woodworking. <laughs> classes yeah. you know on youtube or how-to videos on youtube or documentaries there and i think what we sometimes forget is it's not youtube making that content it's a content creator mm-hmm. making that content mm-hmm. so i actually think i think we might be closer than we already think and some of the interesting things on spring is there's some of our some of those more niche audiences so things like diy or fitness or barbecue cooking channels or they have such feverant audiences Mm. that I kind of think that's endless in terms of you could keep adding all of these different niches so I think it it spans generations and I think it is like it's more so is like if you you're interested in it you're probably going to find someone who's talking about it and we see that on our platform all the time yeah, do you know, and, and I think this is what I actually really love about the whole idea about the content, about the creator economy is that if you look, I mean, if you zoom right, right the way out and you look at the kind of real, uh, you know, over the last hundred years, say, of retail, then a lot of the time modern retail or the big chains that we think about, most of them, a lot of them started in the 50s and it was all yeah. about volume and it was all about go to the Far East, source your products at a very, very low price, bring them back. But you had to create, and there was a real desire to conform. And there was this real move that you had to create something. And, you know, when I worked in big retail as well, you had to create something that 10,000 people would buy. Mm. And I think this is what I love about, I feel almost like the, the creator economy is the kind of final, like, it's like the the bit where you kind of go all the way to the other end where you could say, well, now you it's people creating something that, one person will love, but because it's done for one person, there's actually probably, you know, a hundred people who absolutely love it. And it's going to yeah. mean so much more to them. So the people with the, the red hoodie, that red hoodie is going to really mean something to them in a way that walking into Marks and Spencers and Next just, it doesn't, you're buying something that's created for you rather than something that's created for, you know, 10,000 anonymous people. And I think that that's, there's something really lovely about that. Yeah, I think it is. And I think there's also a really interesting part if you think about those brands who were created in the 50s and 60s. It's like there's also like this very interesting stroke strange consolidation model, right? Of like big brands buying other brands to try and attract those new customers. So yeah. you know, almost in the structure of how we built retail, it was like kind of do well and then get acquired by somebody else. And like then you're part of the group. Whereas this is the total antithesis of that, of mm-hmm. like, okay, like you're almost celebrating the niche, weird and wonderful and, you know, there's a home for everybody. Yeah. I think there's a really interesting question and it's a good, it's a good like kind of framing to end on is at what point the fans become creators themselves? Something mm-hmm. we see with Mariah Elizabeth is if you Google or go onto YouTube and type Mariah Elizabeth unboxing videos, there's plenty of people who are ordering Mariah Elizabeth and then actually filming themselves unboxing Mariah Elizabeth stuff and reviewing those products. Yeah, yeah. So there's such an interesting cyclic kind of nature that it almost the whole thing almost starts again. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. As I said, I feel like we could have kept going all day and I didn't even really get a chance to talk to you even more about digital. Maybe we'll have to have you come back sometime and tell us more about the digital side of things. But thank you so much for your time. And do you want to just tell us a little bit more about how 
if anyone's listening and they think, right, this sounds like the ideal thing for me, I'd love to be able to create my own products on demand. How do they find out more about Spring? Yeah, super simple. Uh, the word Spring. So our, our website is spri.ng, just the word Spring. We've gone super, as simple as it gets. <laughs> so just the word Spring. You can find the Spring for Creators is our social handles, and you can kind of uh, find us there. Uh, if you want to follow me, LinkedIn is my channel. I love LinkedIn. I think I love the structure around LinkedIn. So I'm post. I'm constantly posting content. So there you have it. What did you make of today's episode? Do you consider yourself a creator or do you still very much firmly see yourself as a business owner? It's really fascinating to think about the way that the lines between the two are blurring. And I'd love to hear what you thought of today's episode. Why not come over to Instagram at Resilient Retail Club? Say hi. Let me know what your takeaways were. And of course, I love to see it when people share photos of where they're listening to the podcast. So if you're out and about somewhere scenic or maybe somewhere not so scenic why not snap a pic and tag me at resilient retail club and of course if you have a moment to rate or review the podcast in itunes or you can rate it in spotify as well now in the app then i would be so grateful because all of those ratings and reviews make such a difference to me getting the podcast out in front of more people and of course if you subscribe or follow the podcast you'll be the first to know about each new episode If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then I invite you to check out resilientretailclub.com. The Resilient Retail Club is the membership for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable product business. No more trawling Google trying to find the answers to your questions or wading through general business advice that speaks mainly to service-based businesses. Whether you're still at the idea stage or you've been going for a while but want to get more focused and organised when it comes to your business, the Resilient Retail Club is the place for you. With a library of courses tailored to creative product businesses, several live sessions a month, and a supportive and active community, the Resilient Retail Club is the perfect membership to help you hit your goals faster. Check it out at resilientretailclub.com.